I've been with EY for almost eight years and have spent a lot of that time helping companies set their sustainability strategies, help them identify what metrics are relevant to their business um, and help them move their, that performance onto a place of reporting and disclosure, which, which is becoming um, all important over time. I'm here with you this morning just to talk about the importance of sustainability and, and how you can really connect sustainability to, to long-term value and how you can drive that within your organizations. So I always like to, to get started, and although I'm probably preaching to, to the converted here today, I do like to get started by really just clarifying what sustainability really means. Um, you know, to, to me, how I understand and define sustainability is that it's, it's about managing your triple bottom line. When I say triple bottom line, that is about managing your risks, obligations and the opportunities associated with not only your economic and financial performance but with your social and your environmental performance as well and by doing that you're ultimately creating long-term value for your shareholders so in terms of how you do that and I suppose when you look, look at the wheel here when you think about a lot of people would associate sustainability performance to, to just your environmental impacts and that is to say your impacts on energy emissions water waste biodiversity climate risk on the social side, then, a lot of people would actually associate it with just the community aspect and giving back to communities and, and charitable donations. But in fact, you can see here, there's, there's a lot more indicators and, and risks coming to the fore in this aspect. Issues related to people engagement, health and well-being, um, ethics and human rights, diversity, inclusiveness and equality, these are all aspects that are coming to the fore increasingly. And what we see is that organizations that manage the aspects across that triple bottom line, they're much more resilient in light of changing market conditions and markets are changing rapidly in this space. So the more resilient you are, the more deeply connected you are to all of these aspects around the wheel and the much more enabled you are to react whenever those, whenever those market conditions do change and you're able to keep pace with them. So that's what I define as sustainability. In terms of, of the drivers, Brian has already alluded to, to some of these in his introduction, but I, I think two are absolutely key. Um, the first one that I wanted to start with really is, is around regulation. Um, and I suppose in the last two years, we've seen a lot of regulations come into play, particularly in respect to the new um, EU directives and the Irish regulations in respect to non-financial reporting. There's new regulations around human rights reporting, around gender pay gap reporting, and we're starting to see some of these already in effect, or at least coming into effect, probably within the next one to two years. So was it in terms of the, the non-financial reporting regulation that I mentioned here, this is one in particular which everyone should really take note of if you're not already aware of it. This came in, in, in uh, on the 1st of August 2017, and it requires large companies that are trading on a regulated market that have more than 500 employees to start disclosing their sustainability performance. So they need to have a non-financial statement published in their annual report and a diversity report which speaks to the level of diversity at the board of directors level. So this is starting to get a lot of companies um, a little bit panicked um, because so I suppose up to this point, uh, particularly in Ireland, there hasn't been much of a, an emphasis on the non-financial sustainability reporting aspects. So now there's huge, uh, there's obviously a regulatory need there for many organizations. And, and you know, if you're not actually hit by the regulation, I suppose the disadvantage here is that if you're not reporting this information, you're gonna start to fall behind very, very quickly. Some of the things that's required under this is you need to start disclosing environmental matters, social and employee matters, your performance in respect to human rights, and how you manage anti-bribery and corruption measures as well. So these are some of the aspects you need to start to think about. In terms of, I suppose, climate risk and climate-related disclosures, well, the Financial Reporting Council came out about two years ago and said that they I suppose supported the, the recommendations that were made by um, a task force on climate related financial disclosures and they now require companies to, or they've I suppose encouraged companies, not require, but encourage them to, to start thinking about the climate risks that, are, that they are exposed to within their organisation and start to I suppose disclose some of that, that, that level of climate risk and their strategy and their approach to managing climate within their annual financial reports. So again you start to see the content of the annual financial report changing significantly in response to these regulations. Then I suppose in terms of stakeholders, well, <clears throat> really, you know, the, the pressure for coming down from stakeholders has been increasing significantly year over year, and it just doesn't seem, doesn't seem to, be, to be yielding at all. Um, and companies are really struggling to try and keep pace with, with, with what the stakeholders are demanding. So, you know, Brian mentioned that sustainability, you know, I think it used to be considered a, a differentiating factor. Now, I absolutely agree. It's absolutely a hygiene factor and it sort of gives you this social license to operate. It's just good for business and without it, um, you are going to start to fall behind. 
I suppose some, some of the pressures here, I suppose, even within EY, we're starting to see the supplier requests for sustainability information uh, come to the fore. So the, the procurement departments are taking the lead in this space. They're expecting companies to comply with uh, additional requirements around sustainability performance. So companies want to work with other companies that, are, that their values are aligned with, with, with theirs as well. So you're starting to see sustainability demands come through that procurement function. Customers are making more conscious choices on sustainability products and services. And I think for, for you know, the, the biggest one I would say today is, is that attracting and retaining talent um, is becoming increasingly challenging. So there's a lot of, of pressures coming down on us here in Ireland uh, today, and, and particularly in the likes of us here in EY, at trying to keep good talent is really, really hard. Um, you know, there, there, there's still a bit of an emigration trend. Getting people into our country is, is hard too. And I suppose with the transportation networks, with the infrastructure we have, it's becoming harder and harder to attract people to Dublin in particular. So, so that piece, um, sustainability, is being used as a way to try and uh, differentiate yourself to, a, to an extent and, and try and attract and retain that level of talent. I've given just a bit of a, a quick uh, graph here just to show you, I suppose, um, they, there was an analysis undertaken every sort of 10 years of the Standard & Poor's 500 to, to have a look at their market value and see how that has changed over time. And you can see, going back to 1975, that I suppose 83% of a company's market value was associated with their tangible assets. That was physical assets that were sitting on their balance sheet, and only 17% of those were intangible assets. Fast forward to 40 years later, and now it's 87% of a company's market value is intangible assets. So how do you try and sort of grasp that value and communicate that value back to your stakeholders? And that's what we're seeing is really, really challenging. I suppose the investor pressure, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but the investor pressure is, is mounting significantly. So EY, we undertake a survey every, every year now. We've been doing it for the last three years. And... We in, we, last year we surveyed, it was over 320 uh, institutional investors. They have $10 billion in assets under management. Um, we wanted to get a sense of what was their views on the quality and availability of non-financial information and to what extent do they use this information when they're making their investment decisions. So here you can see that 64% of investors felt that companies do not adequately disclose their environmental, social and governance risks. Um, there was last, in 2015, 79% of uh, the investor respondents felt that uh, basically conduct evaluations of environmental and social disclosures when making investment decisions. We're starting to see that number rise. It was somewhat cons uh, consistent with that number last year, but we are seeing that number rise year over year. So investors are using environmental, social and governance aspects when making investment decisions. 92% of them agreed that CEOs should set out a strategy for long-term value creation and confirm that the, the company's board has reviewed it as well. So I've left a little quote up there from uh, the chairman and CEO of BlackRock who came out there about two weeks ago, and he basically said that companies need to be focusing on environmental, social and governance factors because they do in fact have real and quantifiable financial impacts. So any company that has BlackRock as an investor or you know, want to get a sense of where the investor community is moving in this space, environmental, social and governance aspects are going to be absolutely key to that. So I suppose when you think about it, what, what, what is the challenge? You know, what we're, we're starting to see a really big challenge here in terms of connecting sustainability, which is a relatively recent concept, to financial reporting models, which have remained largely traditional and haven't really changed much over time. So why is there this challenge? Well, firstly, I suppose business models have been transformed. Um, and the, 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 I suppose the impacts of that have been, been really, really significant. Intangible assets are now increasingly representing the impetus behind the generation of value for 21st century organizations. So that's, I suppose, the first thing to bear in mind. The second thing is that the, the awareness and influence of stakeholders has really come to the fore in this space. So, you know, reporting is really struggling to, to keep pace with a changing shape of business and, and reporting, and they're really unable to cater for the rise and importance of a much wider stakeholder group. So the current language of value is becoming increasingly inadequate. So there's sort of a couple of main issues here. Data credibility has become a, a real challenge for organizations. Um, and you think about the likes of ourselves and how we look at data. Everything now, everything we see online is all driven by algorithms. And you know, when you think about it, we're just getting information that other people think we want to see. But as this happens on an increasingly regular basis, it's actually turning into huge challenges. We're not really getting a sense of, of the information's reliability, and we're not questioning information the way that we used to. So data reliability is a big concern. 
this idea of short-termism. So, you know, I think there's, uh, I suppose, an enduring perception from executives and from investors alike that each of the other party is just concerned with short-term, quick decisions and quick investments. And I suppose this is characterized by a continued decrease in areas spend, such you know, in, in long-term investment spend, areas like research and development, those spends are starting to go down. So this idea of short-termism is really, really impacting that idea of connecting value with sustainability. And the last one then is the role of organizations in society. So really starting to question what role does organizations play? Are they just existing to create value for their shareholders? Or do they in fact have a much wider mandate to create value for a much wider group of wider group of stakeholders that takes into account that societal and environmental factors as well? So cumulatively, these issues are actually a signaling, I suppose, a much larger systemic issue. So there's a perceived lack of, of trust, both not only at the organization level, but I would say there's a perceived lack of trust in, in the leaders of organizations as well. So how do we try and break down those, those walls of trust? In terms of, I suppose, current approaches, well, you know, again, we, we wanted to get a sense of what was the, the business leader's view of, of financial reporting and how, what's the investor's view on financial reporting. And here we've seen that 56% of business leaders feel that financial reporting clearly conveys how a company can create value through reinvestment, whereas only 25% of investors feel that they're getting this information. In terms of, I suppose, of, of the, the relevance of, of what's actually disclosed in financial reports, 11% of business leaders feel that they're getting the information, feel that investors are getting the, the uh, financial reporting information that they need from the financial reports. However, we're, also, we're seeing here that 17% of investors believe that current financial reporting meets their needs. So I suppose the broader message here is that at an absolute maximum, only 25% of investors believe that they're getting the information that they need from financial reports. So something needs to change here. Financial reporting is not enough. So the need for change, I think, again, here it, it, it is clear. Um, again, when we, when we talked about this idea of you know, is there a need to overhaul financial reporting? When we asked business leaders and investors this question, they all agreed. 78% of them said, yes, there does need to be, they do need to collaborate um, and overhaul reporting, and 92% of investors felt the same way. So there's been a couple of approaches to try and solve these issues. The first is around, I suppose, additional reporting. So there's been a number of different reporting metrics and frameworks out there, things like the Global Reporting Initiative, the Integrated Reporting Framework. All these new reporting models are out there to help companies understand how, to, how they can disclose and talk about their sustainability performance. But what we felt is that I suppose that there hasn't really been widespread in investor acceptance of those and we're not seeing the, the sustainability information connecting with the financial information enough. So additional reporting is good, but we're not quite getting the connection that we need. We're starting to see, I suppose, there is more disclosure around metrics and KPIs. So the, 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 D, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which I've referenced here, a lot of companies now are starting to try and compete and try and get, get listed on, on large global sustainability indices, like the Dow Jones Sustainability Indices. And that's certainly, I suppose, um, encouraging and, and encouraging more companies to try and, and, and start disclosing more. But again, this isn't filling the gap in terms of how organizations are actually driving and creating long-term value. The last one then we've seen in terms of how they're trying to, to solve this problem is collaboration. We're not seeing enough of this, but I suppose some organizations, um, business leaders and, and asset managers have been coming together in formal sort of coalitions um, to try and raise awareness of the problem um, and, and really try and communicate that issue to a much wider range of stakeholders. So this platform, you know, it's a good solid platform, but I think the, the issue here is it's not used widely enough. So we wanted to try and get a sense of well, what could a new framework for, for long-term value reporting actually look like. <clears throat> so we went out and we talked to academics, investors, and business leaders, and we sort of distilled down all the responses into six broad criteria that companies need to, to think about if they're trying to, to create an effective long-term value report. So the first one is that you need to be absolutely clear about your operating context. So you need to be thinking about what are your impacts on the broader industry, so not just within the confines of your organization, but how do you impact industry? Well, how do business cycles affect you? Are you keeping on top of your competition and talking about where your competition is at in the context of the business? And are you talking about the macro, macro or even the micro trends that could be affecting your organization? So be very clear about that context and set the scene for your stakeholders. You need to be disclosing information that is, in fact, material to the stakeholder, and, and that, I think, is absolutely key. 
you know, it's important that the information you're disclosing in your reports is significant enough that it's going to influence your, your stakeholders' decision-making capabilities. And, and if you're not able to answer that question to yourself, then you shouldn't be talking about it. You need to be absolutely core to purpose and strategy. So you must be talking, you must be describing the one critical thing that your organization stands for. You need to absolutely have a purpose statement. And you need to be talking about how that impacts not only your organization, but how it impacts your relationships with your various different stakeholders and how that's shaping your strategy. The assured and trusted piece. Here, you know, we, we start to see companies disclosing information, you know, this new regulation coming into play. We're going to start to see a lot more non-financial information putting coming into public reports. If it's not assured, it may not be trusted by your stakeholders. And to try and sort of build up that level of trust for your stakeholders, think about that assurance piece and really trying to differentiate yourself from those unproven um, information sources. You need to be able to provide, I suppose, a more complete view of what value really means. So the information that you're disclosing should go much further than just your financial information, but should be including information that pertains to the real value drivers behind your organization. So what do your stakeholders, what do they care about? That's what you talk about. And it absolutely needs to be simple to understand. You know, I've picked up a lot of sustainability reports and annual reports, and you know, if there are anything more than 100 pages really is, is that actually communicating the right information to stakeholders. They're very, very voluminous, very, very complex. So a new reporting framework really needs to be concise and understandable for your, for your stakeholders. So at EY, we've developed what we call the new long, the new long-term value framework. Um, and this looks probably a little bit busy, but I would say break it down into, into those sort of six key areas that I mentioned. It starts out with the context again. So. <clears throat> You know, the first step is to set that context, think about the business cycle, think about the long-term trends affecting your organization, and then think about the factors that are affecting the industry as a whole um, and, and how you can maintain co um, competitiveness with, with your peers and with, your comp with the competition. Have a purpose statement. So, you know, your purpose is, is it's an aspirational reason for, for being as an organization. It needs to be absolutely grounded in, in humanity and it should inspire some sort of a call to action. Everyone in your organization should be very, very clear in your purpose. And that then comes down to linking back to your strategy and governance piece. So you need to be able to identify, I suppose, the strategic assets that you're required or need that, that are needed to be able to deliver on your organization. So by understanding and communicating your strategic assets, you're able to then get a sense of what strategic assets you need to develop or which strategic assets you then need to protect. And therefore, you're actually going to be able to better allocate your, your capital um, to, to the strategic assets that are most relevant to your organization. They should be stakeholder outcome driven. So you need to be very clear who your key stakeholders are. You need to be disclosing the information that matters most to them. And then by delivering against these stakeholder outcomes, that's when you're actually going to be truly creating value for your stakeholders. Strategic assets, so when, so when you think about what strategic assets really are, these are bundles of resources and skills that only your organization can deploy to create long-term value for your shareholders. So these can include anything from an organization's culture to the physical assets that it owns. And the last one then is resources. When you think about resources, we use, I suppose, the integrated reporting frameworks, this idea of their six capitals, which are the, your, that's going to be your financial capital, your human capital, social, natural, manufacturing, and intellectual. So these are all the resources that you have at hand to really try and drive value. I'm going to, I suppose, skip over the next slide, but this is, you know, it's really around just in terms of what could a long-term value report actually look like, and it's breaking it down into three aspects thinking about the context, setting your purpose and, and strategic goals, and then conducting, I suppose, a bit of a stakeholder value analysis to what do your stakeholders really uh, really want to see in, in your reporting. So with the, with the last minute I have here, I just want you to take a look at this. This is a bit of a sense of what does a long-term value report actually look like? And again, we've broken it out by the different assets um, that, that an organization are exposed to. So We've got two here. I'm just going to focus on this one for investors. The next one's on, uh, on employees. But again, you can have a look at this afterwards. I'm happy to share this with anybody afterwards. Um, so in terms of strategic assets, for investors, they're looking to see, well, OK, in terms of, of, of an organization, your employee workforce is, is absolutely your key asset. You've got a product pipeline. You've got your customer loyalty. When you think about what investments you then need to make to try and protect some of those assets, it speaks to human resources investments. It speaks to funding for innovation, then it speaks to protecting and investing in your customers. So you want to try and sort of preserve those key assets that you have. And then in terms of thinking about where you're going to deploy your future capital, it's absolutely going to speak back to those. It's going to, you're going to require revenue. You're going to focus in on your customer network. You're going to be convert, converting your pipeline. You're going to be focusing on your employees. And you're thinking then about ultimate value that's created out of all these aspects. 
everything you can see here in, in, in the rectangular boxes, the next one may actually have some circles here, but everything that's rectangular is in fact quantitative. So you are able to quantitatively determine what value you're creating for the strategic assets that you have as a stakeholder. And the important part, I think, here is really just communicating that uh, back out to all of your stakeholders. I'm going to skip over this one for employees, but again, it looks very similar, but more qualitative aspects in here. Just conclude, I suppose, in terms of a VY, where we've been helping companies is really to try and get a sense of not only just sort of how to create that long-term value piece, but it's really around what does your roadmap for sustainability look like? A lot of organizations are trying to get to grips with what it really means to them. So we've been giving them, helping them along that process of mapping out their governance structure, understanding their stakeholders, doing those state materiality assessments, and bringing them right through to a place of reporting and connecting that reporting back into their annual, uh, their annual reporting uh, structures. So thank you very much for your time. Again, I've got uh, my details are up there. I'll just leave them there for a moment, but uh, I'll be around here all morning. So feel free to give me a shout with any questions.